vision for 2017 for our church and where we want to be. And so it's been an interesting year, 2016. And, and when you reflect back over it, as we already have, we think about the blessings that God has had given to us. We think of the, the heartaches. We might think of the struggles. Uh, even in our own life, I think back even in June uh, the 14th, as I went under the knife, as they would say, and they cut me wide open and spread my back wide open and uh, had that major surgery and how good God was and, uh, and was only down for a couple of weeks, not able to preach. And as you folks know, that's one of my things that I just love to do is to preach and to pastor. And so God was very grateful, and the healing process was rather quickly. And I thought about that throughout the year. Uh, I think about the things that the church has accomplished throughout the year. And some of the things that I go through in my mind is what we put on a list. And some of the things that we wanted to see, and we wanted to see our numbers start to grow. And they started to grow, and then in the last half of the year, we've kind of gotten a little lazy, to be honest with you. And we've been able to, we've dwindled a little bit, but kind of maintained. And so maybe in 2017, we're going to look at trying to boost those back up again and what it's going to take to do that. Uh, and I thought about a lot of different things that we've been able to accomplish, uh, even been able to just put an air conditioner in. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that, that that would have been a major, major undertaking financially for us, and the money was there. And we appreciate the folks that did. Uh, Brother Jerry's not here, he's not feeling well again. Uh, been able to take that project under his wing and just to be able to run with that. And, and I really appreciate those kind of things that we've done. And I think about a lot of other things that we've accomplished, you know, throughout the year that the church has been able to do. Amen. And if you remember back just a few weeks ago, I asked you to take some 3 by 5 cards. Maybe you thought I forgot about them, but I didn't. I kept them in my office, and I, I would go over them over the last couple of months. I think we did this back in October or November. And so I've been going over them, been praying about it, how to kind of categorize them or whatever, and then thought about many different ways uh, to be able to do that. And so... Uh, this morning, I, I just I didn't categorize anything. I just wanted to uh, share them with you this morning. Sorry about that. i got to fix that. That's been driving me crazy. <laughs> so, uh, and I want to just kind of share them with you this morning as some of the things that, that y'all wrote down. There's no names on them, uh, so I don't know who wrote what, except that I can maybe tell some handwriting or whatever, but I went, I'm not going to share the names. Uh, maybe when you see those, you'll think to yourself, well, I wrote that down or whatever. And so this morning I want to read through them so that we can see kind of the mindset and the heart set of our church and to see what we need to pray about in 2017, how to move forward. And then as we do that in a couple of weeks, not next week, but the following week, as we take out our ideas and we come together as a church, we need to think about these things that we wrote on here and then what it's going to take to get there. And so uh, first right off the bat, uh, number one, it just says... Uh, they put the question down, what would I like to see for the future of our church? And this person said, I would like to see more involvement. I want Sunday, uh, Wednesday night Bible studies to continue or to start uh, restart soon. Uh, the second one was volunteering in the community, community projects. Next one is a bigger light in the community for our youth. Next one is a living light uh, house uh, for his son and the Holy Spirit. Next one was to be a witness and a refuge for Jesus Christ. Church growth and spirit in numbers to be the light in the community. More involved. I'll skip this one here. I see, uh, let's see. I see the church growing. More get-togethers involving friends and neighbors and a fish fry. There you go, Jerry. So we're going to fish fry. We had a fish fry and it was really turned out well. Jerry did a great job. Uh, I wish for more members to come to Sunday school. There's a nice one there. We had a pretty good turnout in Sunday school this morning. And so, again, another plug for Sunday school. We just really have a great time. And Ms. Tammy does a great job. Uh, if you're not coming because you don't like her teaching, let me know. And, uh, I'm sure that's not the case, but she does do a great job. So 10 o'clock, it's only an extra hour. Uh, Sunday mornings, and we really do have some great studies. Uh, this morning we studied about worship and how to worship the Lord. And so... Uh, next, I would like to see the church grow in size and numbers. I'd love to see it full. Wouldn't that be awesome to be able to see the church full? Uh, they do say, and just to let you know, they say if you get to 80% capacity, I want, if I remember right, let me think, we can hold about 85 to 90 people. And so you start getting up around 60 people, you need to start looking at expansion. And so there's something to keep in mind. And that's those statistics say around the globe is if you, once you get to 80% capacity, you need to start thinking about expansion. So love to see the church full, love to see more saved. I love that part. Uh, pray, for, uh, pray for more children at the church, gospel singing, and a revival. 
And so those are some good things. I really enjoyed whoever wrote that one down. I love gospel sayings and, of course, revivals and things like that. Revivals are an interesting thing. There hasn't been a lot of revivals over the last year in many churches. I remember last year I went to three or four of them in other churches around. And this year, there are many. I haven't been to any this year. And so, anyways, gospel sings. I love gospel sings and try to get some groups in and things like that. Next one was children's ministry, children's church, youth group, uh, church growth overall, and saved souls. Uh, children in the church, this is kind of a, a main theme, is to get some younger folks in. Uh, to our church, and so because they are the future of the church, and then to build more community involvement for the youth, to bring the youth and younger generation to the church. And so, how are we going to get there? Uh, children's Sunday school, children for Sunday school, and uh, Wednesday prayer meeting. Uh, let me say this about attracting younger people. I was, we had the chance to go to Florida, as you know, for Christmas, and uh, my brother uh, is the pastor of Highlands Baptist Church, and they used to have a morning, Sunday morning service. Uh, and they had a pretty good crowd. They normally run about 150 people, 160. And on Sunday morning, they had 149. And they still had a bunch of visitors, uh, folks away for holidays. But anyways, uh, and he's just doing a great job. They're getting ready to take on an expansion, $600,000 expansion with six, uh, 150 people. Um, but anyways, one thing that they, that they keep in mind with that ministry is that they, they know not to be stuck in the past. And, and that's a hard thing for churches. And I'm just throwing this out there. My dad was talking about, my dad's 74 years old. Just, got, just had a birthday, 74 years old. And this is the, the mentality that the, that the churches that are doing something, are growing, are having. And, and this has stuck right with me. They used to have a big cross on the front of their church. It had been there for 50 years. And the statement was made that the younger generation coming in doesn't care that that cross has been there for 50 years. They really don't. They want to come to a church that's on fire for God, that's growing and doing something for God. They actually painted the building and then put their logo on the front and didn't put the cross back up. Wasn't to offend anybody. It wasn't anything like that. It was just a, it was just a, an idea and a movement. Now listen, I'm not saying that we need to go out there and start taking stuff down. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. All I'm saying is, is that if we're going to attract a younger generation, we've got to, as a church, not just here, but any church, has got to get past the fact that we've done it this way for a hundred years and we're going to keep doing it that way regardless. Those are the churches that are dying. I'm just going to throw that out there. I'm not going to really expand on that. Again, I'm not suggesting that anything. I just want, I want you to put that in the back of your mind that if this church is going to grow and any other churches are going to grow, then we've got to figure out how to move forward. How do we attract a younger generation? Uh, Billy Musgrove and I, we went to Jacksonville Friday. Uh, Bill Sweat, who is Brother Bill's de uh, deacon over there at Fales Pentecostal, he went on a cruise and he had a stroke, and so they flew him into Fort Lauderdale. They moved him to Jacksonville uh, for rehabilitation, so we went down there to see him and pray with him. And we were talking on the way down, and I made the comment that, I said, you know, there, a lot of our small country churches are dying, and they're dying out, and they're closing the doors. Our association has been made up of a lot of small churches. That's just the way it was founded, and it, it thrived for many years. If I remember the uh, from hearing correctly, there was 32 churches at one time. We're down to about 11 or 12, and a lot of them have just closed the doors, and because a lot of them are country churches. And I'm not saying this to scare us. All I'm doing is just putting putting this out there, folks. That as you pray about 2017 and where this church is going to grow, what are we going to do? to help this church to grow? What steps are we going to take to start getting some younger folks in? Now, we've got some well-educated folks, as you may say, wisdom-wise, that are up in years, and we've got some middle-aged folks. Uh, once in a while, we'll get some younger folks to come in, uh, but we don't have an overwhelming group of young people. We don't have a youth group. Uh, we don't have children's church. We just we don't have them. So how are we going to start drawing them in? So we keep a lot of that in mind as we start to enter into 2017. That kind of goes along with the morning message this morning as I really I prayed about what God would have for us this morning as we take and start 2017. Uh, I entitled the message this morning, Choose to Be the Church. Choose to be the church. What is the church? And we talk a lot about what is the church. And I subtitled it, The Seven Churches in Revelation. And God has just really placed upon my heart this year, that if the churches in the book of Revelation, we spent last year, the beginning of the year, we took a series and we went through each individual church in the churches of Revelation. 
And if you remember the churches, Ephesus was the first church. It was the loveless church. The second church was Smyrna, the persecuted church. The third was Pergamos, the compromising church. Number four was Thyatira, the corrupt church. And number five was Sardis, the dead church. Philadelphia, the, the faithful church. And then number seven was Laodicea, the lukewarm church. And I'm not going to take and go back through that series. I prayed about that and I just felt like that was not what God would have for us. But I did come up with this this morning that I want to take and maybe this week and maybe if I can't finish it this week, we'll finish it up a week from Sunday. Uh, but I want to take a, just a brief look at the seven churches. I'm not going to expound on each individual church. If you'd like to hear that, you, it's still on YouTube. I believe we were recording last year at that time. That's how long we've been recording. And so again, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to record uh, over Christmas a guy in Canada who's a friend of Ray Mullis. I've never met this guy a day in my life, but he watches the videos. And he watches them very faithfully out of Canada. And so uh, we appreciate that. But this morning I want to take a look at each individual church this morning just real briefly. I'm not going to spend a lot of time again. Uh, as we break down the different churches, it, it has been said from philosophers that the seven churches in the book of Revelation also are in, correct, in connection with the church ages. Now when we talk about church ages, we're talking about in an actual chronological time period. A time period that the church existed from the first century. Let me break those down for you real fast. If anybody would like to have these notes, I can run a copy off of this particular page. If you'd like them, just... Uh, is any, would anybody like them? Raise your hand. I'll have my wife type it up. Okay, I've got two, three, four. Okay, four, five. I'll, we'll make copies and I'll get them to you. Uh, so that's the seven churches. Uh, but let me just show, uh, tell you the church ages real quick, and then I'm going to break them down if I can this morning. Uh, the first church, which is the Church of Ephesus, is found in Revelation chapter 2, 1 through 7. The time period is from A.D. 30. And the reason it's A.D. 30 is because Jesus was crucified at the age of 33 and a half. And so the church age has started with Christ in A.D. 30, and the first one goes through A.D. 100. And that was called the apostolic age. Now, what does apostolic mean? Anybody know what apostolic is? a big word. It's real simple. Take out the I.C. and you get what? Apostles. So that was the time of the apostles. The apostles, it was Paul and the twelve disciples became apostles. They established the church. That was the first generation church that we would call it. The apostolic age. That was the beginning of the church age. And then number two was Smyrna, which you find in Revelation chapter 2 verses 8 through 11. That starts at A.D. 100 and goes through A.D. 313. Again, if you want a copy, I'll have all these typed up for you. That was actually the Roman persecution. That was right after the apostles, the last apostle. Does anybody remember who the last apostle was that died? John. John. And so right after that, the Roman church, uh, to be honest with you, it was the Roman Catholicism comes in and starts really persecuting Christians. It was the uh, Pharisees at the time. And so that was the Roman uh, persecution. That was that type of age there. The third age was Pergamus. In Revelation chapter 2, 12 through 17 was A.D. 313 through A.D. 600. And that was the church age of Constantine. Constantine. I don't know a lot about Constantine. I've heard the name many a time, times. Maybe you've studied some of that. Um, again, I'm not trying to break all that down. I'm just giving you the church ages. Uh, the next church age was the church of Thyatira, which was Revelations 2, 18 through 29. And that was from A.D. 600 all the way to A.D. 1517. And that was called the Dark Ages, the Dark Ages of the Church. And that was the time that the Christians actually were very cautious and they were, had to go underground uh, throughout uh, Rome and all throughout that because of the persecution. So those were very dark ages. Uh, the next church age was Sardis in Revelation 3, 1 through 6. And that was the year 1517 through 1648. And that was a great age in the church because that was the Reformation, the Great Reformation. That was when the church and the Christians came alive. And that's when a lot of great preachers, if you look back at the circuit preachers that rode the horses, there you go, Miss General, riding horses and preaching. Uh, have you ever heard of the movie Sheffy? If not, look it up. You'll love it. Uh, it was a circuit preacher that would ride on a, on a horse and he would, they would hold tent revivals. The Great Reformation. And that was from, again, uh, from 1517 to 1648. And then the Church of Philadelphia was Revelations 3, 7 through 13. Uh, and then in years was 1648 to the 1900. That was the great, great missionary movement. That's when they started really 
put missionaries throughout the world. Uh, Hudson Taylor, if you've ever heard of Hudson Taylor, one of the greatest missionaries uh, that ever walked on the face of the earth, lived by faith. And another good book or movie to read, uh, missionary Hudson Taylor. He became, uh, took orphans and came in and just lived day by day, literally. Uh, many are great stories about living by faith. And then, of course, the last uh, time period, Church 8, was the church at Laodicea, which is very interesting. From uh, Revelations 3, 14 to 22, it was from the year 1900 to today. Now, this is going to blow your mind of what the church age is. It's the apostasy. The apostasy of the church. And what does anybody know what apostasy means? Say Go ahead. Give it a shot. Turn it away. For it's turn, yeah. Turn it away. It's where they put God on the back burner, if you may say, and the church is just uh, decaying and just deteriorating year after year. And that's where we are at today. Now you say there's some, but there was some great things going on in our century. Absolutely, there has been since the 1900s. But a church as a whole, and again, what's interesting is the church at Laodicea was again known for being what kind of a church? Lukewarm church. And so we're going to take this morning and see if we can't take over the next 20 minutes and kind of break this down for you. Uh, again, real quick, uh, just kind of a teaching sermon this morning, as you may say. But before we dive into the different churches, I just have a question right here. And it's for us right here at Action Evangelistic Church. What church does Action Evangelistic Church want to be? What church? We went down through the churches, and as we look at it, I want you to think about that this morning as we talk about the seven churches this morning, and as you pray over the next couple of weeks, what kind of a church do you want our church to be? And let's look at those churches this morning. Number one is the church at Ephesus. The church at Ephesus was known as the loveless church. That church at Ephesus was known for losing its first love. That church was known for a church that did not love Jesus Christ Himself. It was a church that just turned to, to themselves and became all about themselves, and they lost their first love. What a sad thing. The church became very complacent because they lost their love. And you see, that's easy to do for churches today to become very complacent. And again, if you remember just a little while ago, the, the mentality that the churches are dying for a change. In other words, they'd rather die before they change. You never change the message. You always change the method. You have to. You do that even in business. You might do that in your home. Listen, is anybody still wearing the same clothes that they had 40 years ago? Not very many people besides Brother Drake. But, <laughs> so, but you, is anybody driving the same car that they drove for the last 40, 50 years? And you know, some people live in the same house. Mr. Sally says, well, I've got one of <laughs> He's driving forever. But we update a lot of things, don't we? You know, does anybody have a microwave in the house? How many people have computers? How many people have smartphones? You know, how many people have tablets? I mean, you can go down through the lid. I just got a nice little Bluetooth. It's a little earbud. It sticks in your ear. There's no wires or anything. Just in your ear. It's the coolest thing in the world. I love it. I'm like secret service, you know, walking around. Yeah, go ahead, you know. And so, but, you know, we like changes in our lives. But for some reason, we lost our first love in our churches, and we don't want to get with the times. We don't want to forget the message. We want to preach salvation. We want to preach that Jesus Christ died on the cross. And He's the only one that can cleanse us from all our unrighteousness and cover our sins so that one day we can spend eternity with Him in heaven. You never change the message. But listen, it's high time that the church changes the method, the way we've done things. I'm not saying that you can't do things that you have never done. We're going to keep putting the Christmas tree up. We've probably done that for 50 years. We're going to keep doing it because it's beautiful and there's nothing wrong with it. We're going to keep doing that. But there's other things that maybe we have done for 100 years that maybe we need to start looking forward to and we need to implement into our church. So we don't need to be like the church at Ephesus where they became complacent. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, 1 through 8, we could look at that. The church, the church must have love. And here's a very familiar passage of Scripture that says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have found you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. And you have to remember the church at Corinth was trying to grow, and they couldn't, they couldn't, they had a lot of things going on. For ye are not carnal, for, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? 
For while one saith, I am of Paul, and another I am of Paulus, are you not carnal? Who then is Paul, and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom ye believe? Even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted. Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then remember, he that planteth anything, neither he that planteth watereth, but God that gives the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his labor. That's not exactly the scripture I was looking for. I wonder if that's supposed to be 2 Corinthians, where he talks about love. Let me look at that real quick. 2 Corinthians 3. <coughs> Good. Well, the church needs to have love. That's not the verse I was you looking for. The one that says you have to have charity. The 13. charity verse. What is it? It's chapter 13 about love is patient, love is kind. That one? It could be. You know what? You're probably right. 13, 1 through 8. Go ahead and read that, Ms. Tammy, if you would, because that's probably it. And I just forgot to put the 1 in front of my 3. And yet I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and cannot fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. Okay, so we have to have love in the church. That is the verse I want, the scriptures I wanted. And so the penalty for no love is Jesus would remove the candlestick. Revelations two, chapter uh, chapter two, verse five. I didn't get this one right. And this is what the church of Ephesus, if they if they lost their first love and they didn't get it back, it says, "Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove thy candlestick out of this place, except thou repent." And it's real plain, it says there, if we don't repent and we're not a church of love and we don't try to love one another, that he's going to take the candlestick out. In real plain English, in today's language, what he's saying is, I'll close the doors to the church. And we've seen that in a lot of churches that have become very, very complacent and their love is lost. The second church is the church of Smyrna, the persecuted church. They were persecuted because of their faith in Jesus Christ. The church at uh, uh, Smyrna was known as a persecuted church. Now, today, there's many churches around the world that are actually persecuted. And even right here in America, there's some churches that are affecting persecution. Uh, but there's many of them that are still underground in China and different countries like that that can't meet in public. And so when I thought about that, I thought, you know what? We were on the verge of being close to that in the election time. God's people came out and God's people prayed and God's people voted. And I'm thankful for what God's people did. Uh, but it came very close because if Hillary Clinton had gotten in there, we would be up against a world of hurt, folks. And our liberties and our freedoms would not, as a Christians and religion, we would be fighting and persecuted even more than we've ever been before. And so, it, it very simply, what he says in verse number 10 of chapter 2, he says, be brave. He said, be brave and get out there and give the gospel and everything that we do. He says, fear none of these things which thou shalt suffer. Behold, the devil shall cast some of you into prison, that ye may try, and ye shall have tribulation ten days. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give thee a crown of life. And he says, just be brave. Listen, folks, it doesn't take much to get the gospel out. As we were down in Florida, and we went out to breakfast on Sunday, uh, it was Monday morning, with mom and dad, my sister, and my nephew. And I like to do this quite a bit. You've heard me say this. We got done putting our order in. I asked the waitress. I said, we're getting ready to have grace. Can I ask the blessing? Do you have anything we can pray about? And she said, I sure do. And a big smile came on her face, and we prayed for her little boy. Like restoration in her family. Restoration in her family. And so the other one, I did it again um, with somebody else, and I can't remember who that was. It wasn't with you. But it was probably with Billy. And uh, we, I did the same thing. And so getting the gospel out 
And there's so many different ways just to be brave and get the gospel out. And maybe this year in 2017, your prayer would be that you would be more brave to get the gospel out and to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. They said the reward for, for being brave is a crown of life. To be brave is going to give you a crown of life. Let's move on. Pergamus. Next church is Pergamus. That was called the Compromising Church. They, they uh, worship false gods. Uh, there is only one God, folks. Don't let anybody mistake it. Uh, don't let anybody tell you any different. There's only one God. And I'm glad that our country's motto is under, uh, One Nation Under God. And uh, we serve a mighty God. And But this church was known for compromising. And, and I pray that our church doesn't become a compromising church. And that's why I say you don't compromise the message. You change the method, but you don't change the message. And you keep preaching the gospel and you don't allow the cults to come in and the false teachers to come in. And we're not going to be a compromising church. And so I pray that this morning that we don't. Jesus tells them again to repent. And it's interesting that Jesus is patient and God's patience with us as a church. And His long suffering is so phenomenal that time and time again He gives us opportunities to repent as a church. There's two rewards for repentance. Number one was the hidden manna which we found out that is Jesus Himself. And He says if you'll repent and you'll get away from that compromising, then you can live with Him on a daily basis. You get to partake of Jesus Himself and all the goodness. Again, this morning in Sunday school, we talked about the joy and the joy that we can have in serving Jesus. And what a joy it really is. You say, oh, that's easy for you because you're a pastor and a preacher to have that joy. But I'm here to tell you this morning that even if you're not, if you're... If you go out every day and you're working for a living and you're doing different things, you can still have that joy. Listen, folks, there's no greater joy than to tell somebody that Jesus loves them and then watch them give their heart and their life to Jesus. There's no greater joy than that. There's no greater joy than to pray for a miracle and to watch God perform a miracle. You want that joy in your life? Make sure you're not compromising. We need joy in our church. We're not going to compromise as a church. The second reward not only was the hidden man, but number two was a white stone. We found out as we studied back through this last year that a, a reward of a white stone. Does anybody remember, by the way, not to put anybody, if you don't, don't worry about it. I, I understand that was a year ago. Anybody remember what the white stone was? Changeless purity. Changeless purity. He says if we won't compromise, then we, our reward will be changeless purity, which of course will come in heaven one day when we spend eternity with Jesus Christ. Don't allow the false gods into the church. <coughs> what are our false gods? <coughs> Anything that takes the place of the true one God. Don't allow the false gods to come in. Don't allow something to become more important. We talked about worship this morning, and that's really great. But we've got to make sure that our, our worship doesn't become performances. We've got to make sure that as I preach a message, it doesn't come from flesh. It comes from above. And everything that we do, we make sure that we don't put something else before God Almighty on a daily basis. <coughs> you see, make sure that you have a habit, whether it's morning, whether it's an afternoon, maybe it's night, whatever it would be throughout the day that you spend time with God. Don't allow something else to take its place. Let's move on to the next church, number four. The church of Thyatira was the corrupt church. This is the church that I pray that our church never become. Revelations 2, 18 through 20, he talks about this corrupt church. He says, Under the church of the angel of the church of Thyatira, write these things, saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire. He's really upset. Anybody ever seen flames of fire in somebody's eyes? Yeah, like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works and charity, which is love, and service and faith, and thy patience and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Was that 20? Okay. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants, to commit fornication, to eat things sacrificed unto idols. They had allowed this Jezebel, which we found out was a false religion. And we find out if you go back into the Old Testament, you can read about Jezebel and how wicked she was. She was the wife of who? Who was it, Brother Drake? Right. King Ahab, right? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so, I always hate it when somebody puts you on the spot like that. <laughs> I know the answer, but you got me off guard. And so, but King Jezebel, and what a wicked king King Ahab was. 
And so Jezebel was just as wicked and just as bad. And so we need to be careful that we don't become allow the idol worships to come in. And what are idols? Anybody know what idols are? Yeah. It doesn't have to be a statue. You know, it could be anything that we put above God. I pray that our church never has anything above God. May we never become a place where we don't talk about God, where we don't read the Word of God, where we don't preach and we don't sing about Him. There's a lot of churches out there that are doing that. You know, the modern, the modern word for that is tickling ears. And there's a lot of preachers out there that will preach prosperity. And if you'll just give and plant that seed, and if you'll put $1,000 into the offering plate, God's going to reward you with $10,000. And they preach that kind of stuff. So we be very careful. The other problem was, and this happened in a lot of churches in, the, in our church age, is that the church of Thyatira was also known for its sexual immor immorality that had creeped into the church. And some of the things that were going on, and I'm ashamed to say that many preachers and many pastors out there have been caught in different scandals and, and different affairs and things like that. And, and one of the great ones, even that, or unfortunately, that happened that was really uh, impacting young people, Clayton Jennings got caught doing some immoral things. He's repented and hopefully he'll get things right with God, which he says he has and come back and do some great and mighty things. But you've got to be very careful. And you see, it doesn't just affect the preachers and it doesn't just affect the secretaries. It can affect anybody within the church. One of our pre preachers uh, that I know, he actually visited here before. He took a church up in Macon and what, some of the stuff that he was telling me that was going on in the church of immorality was just mind-boggling that was going on with some of the people in the church. So be very careful that we don't become like the church of Thyatira. The church of, of Sardis was a dead church. Oh, I pray that our church never becomes a dead church. What's interesting about the church of Sardis was that the, the city actually thought they were alive. They thought they were alive because there was a lot of things going on, but they were dead. And when we talk about a dead church, we talk about a church that really plays the, is religious, and they play the theme, and they play the song. Here's a scary thing, folks, and I'm going to say this, that we need to be careful that we don't become, now watch this, we don't become a Sunday morning church. We don't become a one-hour-a-week church. There's things that you can do outside of the church, and there's things that we need to put in place, and we need to, and y'all put them on the cards. We want fellowships, and we want more involvement. We want things like that, and we need to strive to be like that. Listen, when we become a Sunday morning, one-hour-a-week church, that's a dangerous place to be. It really is. Get quiet real quick, didn't it? Jesus warning to the to either to either wake up or he will come like a thief and close him up. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 3. In the church of Sardis, he says this. He said, Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. And he says, if you're not careful, he says, I'm going to come in unannounced. A thief comes in unannounced. And when he comes in, he's very quiet and very sly. That's when I think of a thief. And I think about somebody that comes in and takes something away. And Jesus warns him, and that says at the church that started, if you don't become alive, if you're not careful, I'm going to come like a thief in the night. And I'm going to close the doors to that church. The church in Philadelphia, I like this church. This is a church of brotherly love, as you may say, the faithful church. This is a church that I pray that everybody here, as you pray over the next two, three weeks, that you would pray that Action Evangelistic Church would come like the Philadelphia church. May we become a church that's faithful. May we become, listen, I can preach on love all day long. And as a church, we're great when it comes to loving one another, doing for one another, doing for people outside of the community. And that's a great thing, and we're going to keep doing that. But that's only part of it. Because this church was faithful. What were they faithful to? They were faithful to God Almighty. They were faithful on their daily walk. They were faithful to come to church. They were faithful to do what God had called them to do. If God has given you something to do, then you need to do it faithfully. I think of faithfulness. I think of Miss Tammy. Every single Sunday morning, she's here. If she's not, she gives me a text and says, I can't make it tomorrow. Jerry's sick or I'm sick or whatever. But they're faithful every single week, which a lot of you folks are faithful. And look around, and I think that most of you are here on just on a pretty regular basis. There's a lot of churches out there. Pastor, this past week we were talking, and he says, he says, you know, he gets frustrated because of the church hoppers. And you've heard of them. There's people that go from church to church, and they just can't settle in anywhere. I'm not talking about visiting. If people are visiting, I understand that.
And I'm talking about people that will go to a church for a little while, and then they stir things up, and they get mad at the preacher, they get mad at somebody, and they go to another church. And they go over there, and they'll stay there for a little while, and they'll do the same thing. And those, those people are very frustrating to a pastor. And they're very frustrating to a church because they come in and they disrupt and they want to just tear things apart. I'm grateful that we don't have any of those here. They may come one day and that's okay. But as a church, we need to stay faithful. They were faithful to church and Jesus rewards them two ways. This is pretty awesome. You want to give rewards? Who here likes rewards? Anybody? Nico does. Nico loves rewards. I know I talk about him a lot. But you know what? He gets a bath, he gets a reward. I'd like to have a reward for taking a shower every day. That'd be kind of cool, wouldn't it? You do. You get to smell good. But anyways, here's the two reports. And Jesus rewards are twofold. Number one, he says, their persecutors will bow before their feet. I think about that a lot. Maybe it's because of my personality, and I think a lot of things of people that are persecuting the church, the people that behead the Christians, the people that are just really tearing up Christians, and one day they will bow down. And you know what? When you look at that, my mind immediately goes to the verse that says, Every knee shall bow, every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And do you realize when that happens, you and I as Christians will be standing there mm -hmm. with God Almighty, with Jesus Himself, and we will experience those bowing down before God Almighty. He says, if you'll stay faithful to me, you'll get to experience that. Number two, he says, if you're faithful to me, he would not make them go through the hour of tribulation. You can look that up. We talked about that. There was two thoughts here in the commentators. Number one, which is the one that we hold to, is the pre-trib. Pre-tribulation rapture. That Our association, I and myself, and all of our people, most of them are pre-tribulation. Real simple what that means. That Jesus is going to come back in the clouds. He's going to sound the trumpet. And you and I are going to be taken out of this earth before the tribulation period happens. That's the first thought. The second thought was that he will keep them safe through the tribulation period. Some hold to that. If they're a mid-trib or a post-trib, they take that verse to say that these, if you're faithful to him, you won't suffer through the tribulation period. Personally, I stay with the fact that I'm a pre-trib. I'm not going to be here in the tribulation. God has never left his people during judgment. In the time of Noah, he took them on an ark. They didn't go through that. Anytime that God destroyed, even in Sodom and Gomorrah, he took his people out. And you can go down through the ages and you can look at that. And there's many different things to know that why I believe that we're pre-tribulation. We're going to be out of here. God's not going to make us go through that suffering. True. There's so many things that are going to happen. The last church is the church of Laodicea, the Wilform Church. This church here, I pray that none of our churches, and, that, and, and the scary thing is, ladies and gentlemen, as I said at the beginning of this message, that the modern church age from the 1900 until present is in this church age. We are in a lukewarm church age. We are in an age where our churches don't want to do anything for God. We're in an age where our churches, all they want to do is just get together, sing a few songs, take up an offering, say the announcements, hear some guy get up, hoot, holler, and scream, and get out of the door. And that's a sad day. But I'm here to tell you that there's a lot of churches today that are not like that. There's still a lot of churches today that are on fire for God. There's still a lot of churches that are doing things for God Almighty and bringing people in. Right around the corner, Brother Chris over there, he's, when he got there three years ago, three and a half years ago, they were running probably about eight or ten people. And now they're averaging over 50 on a, on a Sunday school and 55 to 60 in Sunday morning service. That is unheard of, folks. Those kind of percentages of 50 people coming to Sunday school and only five or ten can't make it to Sunday school and they're coming to church. I'm here to tell you that most of the time it's the other way around. Usually there's only a handful of people in Sunday school that everybody else comes to church. It's a lukewarm age. Our churches, and I talk to people all the time, even a church here local at the beginning of the summer cut out their Sunday night services because enough people just weren't showing up. They're cutting out Wednesday night services. They're cutting things out. Now listen, it's okay to cut them out, but you need to substitute them with something. Here's something that God's been just working on my heart. I'm not saying we need to do this. It's just a thought that I put out there. That I would love to have a Friday night service of nothing but praise and worship. And get together. You see, because so many people are so busy throughout the week, and I understand that. Listen, we had a midweek service just before Christmas. Some of you were sick, some were traveling. We had two ladies show up. I'm thankful they showed up. Listen, I'm not here to spank anybody. I'm not here to say anything. But that just tells me that we're very busy people. 
and understand that. So what we have to do as a church is, is to keep away from becoming a lukewarm church and how not to be the church of Laodicea. How do we go about doing things a little different? Remember what I said at the beginning of the message? We change the method, not the message. So how do we get our churches to grow and how do we get them to still keep doing things? Because if we, the reason we come to church is to lift each other up. It's to edify the saints. It's to encourage. It's to grow. It's to give us that kind of an energy boost to get us started at the beginning of the week. So what do we do? What do we have to do to try to get things going? Oh, that we wouldn't become like the church at Laodicea that we find in Revelation chapter 3, 14 through 22, which we won't read about. What did God think about that church? He said it was disgusting. It made him sick to his stomach to the point where he said, I spew them out. I pray that you and I don't become the church at Laodicea where we're lukewarm and God says, I can't even stand you. I can't even stand the bell of you. I can't stand the smell of you. I'm to the point where I'm just going to spew you out. I'm going to write Ichabob over your doorstep, over your door jam. I'm, not going to, I'm going to write that and close the doors. That's the danger. That's the warning, ladies and gentlemen. I believe there's a lot of people here in this church, even this morning, that love this church. You've been in this church all your lives. Oh, but it's time that you and I get on fire for God. And how do we make this church be, on, be alive once again? Listen, the preacher can't do it all. It takes everybody. i got to do my part. I understand that. And I'm ready to do it. But it takes everybody. You see, the church at Laodicea was a very wealthy church financially. They had plenty of money. Jesus asked them, though, to invest in Him. One thing that's very interesting is that I, I've got another church. I've talked to a lot of preachers, obviously, being a pastor. And there's a church out there that's got quite a bit of money sitting in the bank. But they're afraid to spend it. And I'm not asking that we go out and spend every penny we have. I'm not saying that whatsoever. We need to be good stewards of God's money. We need to have a reserve, and thank God we did because we had an air conditioner go out. But what I'm saying is, is we need to put our money where our mouth is. And we need to do things to bring people in. We, and we have done those over the year. We've got a video camera we've done. We've done an Easter egg hunt. And, and we could go down through the list of different things that we do. We bring in a guest speaker or somebody who take up a love offering. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I've never been in a church of this size that did so great in love offerings. That's because of you and your love. <coughs> but the danger is is that we become lukewarm. The danger is as a church we become lukewarm and we stop doing things for God. And again, we become a one hour a week church. <coughs> what are we going to do to get there? And I'm saying all that to say that in two weeks we're going to talk about it. And I'm asking you to pray about it for the next two weeks. But Jesus says invest in Him. Invest your time, invest your money, invest your talents. Invest in Him. You're never too old to invest in Him, are you, Brother Drake? Brother Drake's probably the oldest man here. He's probably the oldest guy living. No, that's not yet. <laughs> but even at 85 years old, Brother Drake still wanted to do things for God. Amen. Never too old. You're never too busy. Oh, but you don't know my schedule. I'm going to tell you something. I don't mean to embarrass anybody. Brother Jerry, go ahead and shut that off because I'm going to get a little personal from here on out. Some of you are very, very busy. And you listen.